I'm just waiting for the director to say action. Okay, good morning. Greetings to you in the name of the Lord on this second Sunday of, of Easter. It's great to see all of you here this morning. Um, you may or may not know that uh, traditionally the Sunday after Easter is referred to as Low Sunday. I think some people think that's because the attendance is going to be really low after, after Easter. Well, that's not the case this morning. That's not what it means anyway. It actually is a reference to, the, to, to um, high worship as opposed to as opposed to more standard uh, worship and going from Easter to the, to the Sunday after. But, but uh, it's, it's great to see you all here. And for those of you who are joining us via Facebook or YouTube, we're glad that you have tuned in, as it were, and hope that we will be able to see you in person um, at, at some point. Though I, I will say there are probably at least some people who we won't ever see in person because I'm told we've had people who have viewed our Sunday broadcasts uh, in Europe, in Australia, in just all over the world. So uh, we are on the map, folks, <laughs> and, that's, and that's a good thing. A uh, couple of things I want to mention. One is uh, that uh, we are having a Red Cross blood drive on Monday. That will be from one to six. Now, the bulletin says, and this is what we've been told all along, that, that appointments are required. However, it is also the case that if you haven't made an appointment, you can still donate blood. Uh, last time, they had at least a couple dozen walk-ins, and they were happy to, to drain them as well. So um, even if you haven't made an appointment, you can, you can still uh, do that tomorrow at the Main Street Center, and they'll be glad if you will. Um, the Women's Association meets this Wednesday for their monthly monthly meeting. That is for all of the, the women of the congregation and those from outside that you might like to invite to, uh, to join them. Uh, that's going to be in the library. Uh, they've moved back from the Main Street Center for that, so uh, please please take note of that. Uh, there is one other thing that I wanted to mention, and um, uh, this, is, this is certainly less happy news, but uh, for those of you, I know some of you have already heard, and thank you very much for your prayers and your condolences. Um, for those of you who have not heard, uh, my, my good friend Asher Ascria of the Assyrian Aid Society in Iraq uh, passed away from COVID at the age of 46 on uh, Friday morning, and uh, um, it, it's, it, anyway, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't say anything more about that except, except that he's gone, and, and it is, uh, it's been really hard for, uh, for a lot of people, not only in Iraq, but people who knew him around the world, so uh, if you'd be praying for his family as a wife, uh, two daughters and a son, um, uh, one teenager and the others younger. And so uh, please be praying for them. They, quite frankly, even with, with Asher gone, they're still in danger. Uh, his wife has COVID at the moment, and uh, there's still danger from elements that don't appreciate the work that, uh, that they have done. So thank you very much for that. All right, if that is all I think it is, let's worship the Lord.
Good morning. Join me for the call to worship. Call to worship this morning is from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Who forgives all your iniquity. Who redeems your life from the pit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that your mercies are new every morning. God, that today we plead for the mercy of your presence, that as we have gathered here in this place under your banner of love and in your name, your promise is that you would be here with us, that we may encounter you as we sing your praises. God, that we may encounter you as we hear your word read. God, that we may encounter you as we hear your message proclaimed. God, as we pray to you, that we may encounter you, that we may experience you, that, Father, that we may be here to worship you. And we ask that in Christ's name. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is hymn number 168, The Day of Resurrection, either in your hymnal or above me on the screen. Father, we thank you for this day and another chance to gather as a church family. We're thankful for faces that we haven't seen in a while and, and that's encouraging as, as we see things hopefully return to some sort of normal. We praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one true God. We thank you that you created us, you sustain us, you provide for us, 
You redeem us and you protect us every day. We thank you that you wrote it all down for us in your word. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, and for sending Jesus to die for our sins and to be resurrected so that we might live with him. Father, now we lift up members of our church family and friends of our church. We pray for the family and friends of, of Asher, Ascria of the Syrian Aid Society. We pray that you would be uh, with his wife as she battles COVID with his children and that you would continue to protect them and watch over them uh, during this time and as in the days ahead. We pray for Brad and Samantha Dawson as they mourn the loss of Brad's father this past week. We pray for Bonnie Vines, who is recovering from a stroke that she had on Easter Sunday. We, uh, we lift up Russell Heilman, the father of Josh Heilman, who was uh, critically injured this past weekend. We pray for Cheryl Stamp's daughter, Amy, who's been diagnosed with thyroid cancer and for her upcoming surgery. And Lord, we have so many folks in our family, uh, in our first EPC family and friends that are dealing with chronic health issues and, and awaiting surgeries and, and other things like that. And so we just pray for them, Lord. Uh, we pray for Dick Nance's sister, for Barb Throgmorton, for Bobby Hoyle, who was sent back to the ER last night, for Gretchen Cosby, who's doing well, but recovering, for Angie Gearhart, for the good report we heard from her latest incident with her heart, for Jamie Hadley, Jim Hadley's brother, for the Wright family and their baby Rowan, for Karen and Ron Hubbs, for Katie Horn, Tabby Smith, Steve Schnell, Zach and Cassie Cohen and their family, Leslie Santolano, Sherry Vandersloos, Donald Vines, who we hear is improving and we're thankful for that, for Betty Matthias, Alice Edelman, Pat and Doc Miller, and for Norm Hickam. Lord, we pray for the protection and freedom for persecuted Christians and missionaries and Christian organizations around the world. We pray for godly, for your wisdom for our uh, national, state, and local leaders, as well as your protection for those, uh, those first responders that go into trouble to help, and for those that defend our country in the, service, in the military service. And Lord, we, we pray for our church. We pray for First EPC, for its leadership, its ministries, its staff, and its congregation. And Lord, we thank you for Pastor David and Mary Ann. We pray that you protect and sustain and encourage them in their ministry here. And that you'd be with Pastor David this morning as he brings us your message. Fill our hearts, teach, and challenge us through your word. And now we pray as Jesus taught the disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from Acts 4, 32 through 35. They had everything in common. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. 
And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person with them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as they had need. Please stand for the reading of the gospel, which comes to us this morning from the gospel according to John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Last week we celebrated the resurrection and there was much rejoicing, but that day does not stand in isolation, of course. There have been almost 2,000 years since then, and even at the time, the days went on after Jesus had, rid had risen and circumstances had to be dealt with. Here we are uh, in John chapter 20, beginning with verse uh, 19, uh, the evening of the resurrection. Still the same day, but uh, things were... Things were proceeding. Uh, the word had gotten around, and evidently they had all seen, except Thomas. Uh, Thomas we've talked about before. We will again on another occasion. But on this occasion, first, Jesus appears to the 11, and very, might very well have been to others as well. He comes among them. And he, uh, he greets them. Shalom Alechaim is uh, almost certainly what he would have said, though the New Testament was written in Greek. Uh, Jesus uh, would not have been speaking it with, uh, with these folks. He'd have been speaking Aramaic with them. Shalom Alechaim, peace be with you. And upon hearing that, of course, they were delighted that they were encountering yet again the risen Lord who showed them his hands where the nails had been driven in. The word hand, by the way, there doesn't necessarily mean in the palm, which is the way most people think of it, more likely the wrist. Uh, and his side where he had been stabbed by a Roman spear. And that was a common practice when it was uh, apparent that someone had was most likely dead, but just to make sure that they're not simply unconscious, they'd stab them. Oh, the Romans knew how to do execution. Oh, goodness. Well, he showed them his hands and his side. They were glad when they saw, saw the Lord. And, uh, and here he gives uh, one version of his commission. You all know his commission, of course. Uh, we think of it as the Great Commission. Uh, go into all the world and make, and make disciples of all nations. Well, here he says, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. You are to go out into the world. You are to preach and to teach as I have. You are to spread the good news. 
You are to be to the world the embodiment of the risen Christ even after I have departed. And that, in fact, is what we all are as the church. We are the body of Christ, the body of Christ that is here. Christ, of course, has ascended and he has left us behind to continue his work and to tell the world of him and who he was and is and what it is that he is still doing. Well, the key verse in this passage, of course, is verse, uh, our verses 22 and 23. And first, he says to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is not meant to take the place of what happened at Pentecost, Several weeks later, uh, scholars are of the opinion that this is a form of preparation for the full reception of the Spirit, uh, that they would receive that Holy Spirit and it would empower them for ministry and for a variety of other things. One of the things that the Spirit is given to them for is spiritual discernment. Uh, they're able to, uh, to recognize a couple of things, well, actually, they're, they're empowered to recognize a great many things, but in terms of this passage, they're, uh, they're enabled to recognize two primary things. One is they're able to recognize who is repentant when they sin and who is in need of restoration to the fellowship of believers. Uh, a second thing that they are given the power to do is to recognize those who in fact are unrepentant when they sin, who are in need of the discipline of the church, even to the point of excommunication. Now, when he says receive the Holy Spirit, there is much more involved in that. We could talk about the, uh, the um, gifts of the Spirit that Paul talks about. We could talk about the fruit of the Spirit that he outlines in Galatians 5. Uh, there are, that, what I've just said doesn't in any way limit what, he's, what, he, uh, what, what the, the work of the Holy Spirit is. But at this moment, He's giving them a particular charge, okay? And giving them the Holy Spirit in order to carry out that charge. And that is described in verse 23. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now you might be interested to know that uh, the many authorities, of, that among the many authorities that I consulted to understand this passage this week, uh, a good number of them simply choose not to deal with this verse at all. <laughs> they simply ignore it. Um, they, they'll talk about everything else in chapter 20, but this one just goes by the wayside. They don't want to deal with it. Uh, part of the reason for that is because this is a passage that historically has been cited by uh, the Roman Catholic Church to, uh, to not to justify, as a basis for uh, the sacrament of reconciliation, also called penance um, or confession. Uh, this gives the power to the priest, it is said, uh, to forgive sins, to uh, to, um, to specify uh, discipline in response to them, not punishment, mind you. I don't think uh, saying the Lord's Prayer is meant to be a punishment, okay, but a discipline. And to pronounce that sins are forgiven, or if in their judgment that is not appropriate in a given situation, to say that those sins are not forgiven. Now, that's that's the, the historic Catholic position. And it's obvious from what's said why that is believed. And there are a lot of biblical scholars who simply don't want to deal with it, which is unfortunate because, in fact, there's something here not just for Catholic priests, but something for us, for all of us uh, as well. And so I think we do need to 
to deal with that. And that's because there's a very real sense here in which, uh, in which forgiveness either takes place or doesn't take place according to, uh, to human action. Uh, one thing we need to realize right off is that forgiveness ultimately is God's job. It is God who forgives or does not forgive as he chooses, okay? The basis for his forgiveness is the sacrifice of Christ on the cross and the forgiveness that he gives is to those who embrace that sacrifice. Um, he, uh, he forgives, okay? Uh, but at the same time, at the same time, the apostles, and with them all Christians, because it's pretty obvious there are more people in this room than just the apostles, so this isn't limited to them, nor is it limited to those who are, who are ordained in their, in their footsteps. Uh, this is, this is for, for all Christians, and we all have a very real role to play in the process of forgiveness, if not eternally, than in this world. Uh, it has been pointed out that it is very difficult to translate uh, this verse uh, because of the grammar of the Greek and the differences between Greek grammar and English grammar. Probably the best way to put this would be if you forgive the sins of any, well, they have been forgiven. Your forgiveness reflects the forgiveness that God has already done. And on the other hand, if you withhold forgiveness from any, it has been withheld. Before you ever spoke, it has been withheld. God's forgiveness or non-forgiveness takes place before we ever become part of the process. However, while the eternal decision has been made, there are still consequences in the world and there are still responses that need to be made by those who are standing in the place of Christ, embodying his presence in the world. We, in fact, have been commissioned as conduits for the proclamation of God's forgiveness or non-forgiveness. A couple of examples from the book of Acts uh, taking place within weeks or months of, uh, of this evening, this, this Easter evening. You remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira in uh, Acts chapter 5. They said that they were going to sell a field and they were going to give the proceeds to the apostles to use for the needs of those who had nothing. Well, they did sell the field and they got the proceeds and at that point they decided, you know, this is a lot of money. Um, we'll, uh, we'll keep a commission, okay? We'll, we'll keep back a, a, a little bit of it uh, for, for ourselves. We'll give, a, we'll give most of it to the, to the apostles, but you know, we, we did a job here. We acted as the real estate agents, right? So, so we deserve the, the commission for that. Well, the response of Peter was, you have lied, and you have lied not to men, but you've lied to God. Judgment had already been rendered by God, and all Peter did was say, what you have done in lying to God is not something that God will forgive. And you remember the very next thing that happens is that Ananias and Sapphira fall dead at the apostles' feet because they had lied to God. Now, does that mean that every single time any one of us needs to, or ever, not needs to, every single time one of us uh, 
says something to God that is not true or says that we're going to do something and then do not follow through, that we had better get our coffin ready because God is going to strike us down. No, this is not meant to be prescriptive. Every time this happens, this is going to be the result. That's what, the, that's what the, uh, was the case in this situation. Uh, I suspect simply because God wanted to impress upon them the importance of being truthful when you speak to him. Okay? Being truthful when you speak to him. And so what Peter did was pronounce that God was not going to forgive this this, uh, in this particular situation. Um, another example in, uh, in the book of Acts, chapter 8, uh, Simon Magus uh, offers money for the Holy Spirit, which sounds really stupid to us. I don't mind telling you. The first time I read that, I thought, so they think that, he thinks that paying money means that people can give God to him. I'm not even sure how that works. I mean, what, 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 what exactly was he thinking? I don't know. Uh, but the response that Peter had to that was, your money perish with you. Because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money, your heart is not right in the sight of God. Okay, at least for that point, that time, uh, Simon's sin was not going to be forgiven and he then begged for forgiveness. We don't have a record that he ever received it. We don't know whether he did or not. However, however, at the same time, we also have lots of instances where people do sin and come to the, come to the, the apostles for forgiveness and they make clear that that is available. Now, all of this is not to say that we forgive sin in place of God. It is to, or not forgive sin in place of God. It is to say that we, as a body of believers, have a message to deliver. And that message is that God takes sin seriously and that God forgives sin for those who embrace the sacrifice of Christ and that those who don't have rejected that offer of forgiveness and will not be forgiven of that. That is a powerful message. That is the kind of message that breaks hearts or fills them with joy. Everyone we know, including ourselves, are looking for forgiveness. Everyone wants to know how they can make things right. Everyone wants to know how broken relationships can be restored. And we have the key. We have the key to that. We bring that message and the result can be transformative. The result can be life altering. Uh, to, to hear that message is literally to have a, a weight lifted off your shoulders. To know that it is possible no matter how, how bad one has been, no matter how much evil one has done, that there is forgiveness at the foot of the cross. It is that of which Jesus is speaking when he tells them, if you forgive the sins of any, you're telling them that God has forgiven them. And if you withhold forgiveness from any, you are telling them that God will not and has not forgiven. We have, we have the key in many ways to life. And the question is, are we going to 
offer that key to those who need it. That's the commission that we've been given. That is a power that has been given here to the apostles and to the others who were with them, but it is retained by the church even now. In the early church, they saw this power as being passed uh, later on after, after the writing of the New Testament. They saw this power being passed from bishops who, uh, who were in succession from the apostles to, uh, to priests, clergy, teaching elders who worked under them. They would offer that, that forgiveness. And uh, that's part of the basis upon which uh, at, our, at every communion service, following our silent prayer of confession, uh, I then speak offering assurance that God has indeed forgiven those of us who have repented of our sin and confessed to him and embraced, embraced the cross. But at the same time, it is also true, this isn't, this isn't just about this isn't just about elders, this is about every one of us. Because every one of us has the capacity not only to proclaim that message, but to live that message. And that, I think, in some ways, may be the most important thing that I wanted to bring this morning, is that the message needs to go out there and the way the message is best heard is when people see it in us when people see us forgiving the wrong that is done to us. Jesus talked about turning the other cheek. And a lot of people think, well, that means we don't do anything when somebody, when somebody offends us. No, not necessarily. It doesn't necessarily mean we hit them back. But it may well be that it means we confront them and we say, you do realize what you've done here, that your words were, were hurtful that your action harmed me. You do realize that, that that's what's happened, right? And if they say, well, yeah, I, I, can, I can see that, our follow-up can then be, yes, it has, and I forgive you for that. And in seeing and hearing that, people see and hear what Christ has done for them. Remember, we embody his presence here in the world. As we forgive, people hear him forgiving. He may have already done so, but at that point they genuinely hear that message. God uses each of us. He uses some of us in really big ways that touch the lives of thousands or millions. He uses others in ways that touch just a handful of lives. But if every life is precious in the sight of the Lord, then every single one of us is doing God's work when we exercise the power to forgive. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you that you have forgiven us. That our sins have been set aside and that you have made us children of God. Father, we pray that you will enable us to take that message of forgiveness and reconciliation into the world. 
use us as living, living embodiments of the mercy and grace extended by our Lord on the cross and in the resurrection that the world might see and that the person sitting next to us might see how great your grace and mercy are. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And speaking of grace, how appropriate, Pastor. The closing hymn this morning is number 288, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. And now, as you depart, receive this benediction from the Lord. May the God of all grace, who has forgiven us our sin and sent, into, sent us into the world to spread that message of forgiveness, go with us and be seen at work in us and through us, both now and forever. Amen.
coworker Ryan.